Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the 2012 Harris de U. Lentz Lecture. Uh, the memorial lecture, actually, uh, uh, for Mr. Lentz. Uh, this lecture occurs every three years, and the presenter is normally also the Harris de U. Lentz lecturer for that academic year. Today, we're honored to have Dr. Stephen Junkite present us his lecture, Geography, Religion, and Power, the Production of Space in Modern Christian Thought, which I'm very curious to hear. I think you are, too. There will be an opportunity for a question and answer session after the lecture, uh, and I'll adjourn the, the total session no later than 640, because I think uh, Dr. Junkite's coach will be awaiting him. We don't want it to turn into a pumpkin, uh, which I think happens at 645. So, um, so we will be punctual tonight, and uh, I hope that should give us uh, something like 20 minutes probably for questions. Um, I want to begin the program by introducing first the lectures as a series here uh, at Harvard, and a word about their donor, and then about my own colleague, Professor Stephanie Paulsell, who's going to introduce Dr. Jungkite more formally to you. Uh, Mr. Horace de U. Lentz was a Harvard College graduate of, 19, uh, of 1891, who went on to become a lawyer and a member of the bar in Carbon County, Pennsylvania. As the first agent of the Palmer Land Company, Mr. Lentz played an active part in the establishment of the now thriving town of Palmerton. He was a believer in the principles advocated by the Democratic Party, but never sought office, save on one occasion when uh, the, we gather that he failed uh, to be elected, but he sought uh, election as a, or sought to be, became a candidate for nomination for Congress in the 26th District in 1912. The terms of his memorial lectureship are as follows. His residuary bequest is, quote, to my alma mater, Harvard University, for the establishment of the Horace de U. Lentz Memorial Lectureship, the income to be used by the said university for the giving of one or more lectures every third year by some outstanding Christian priest, minister, or layman upon the inspiring things he may discern in the words Christo et Ecclesiae, which appear on the Harvard seal, end quote. Mr. Lentz also provided a scholarship fund that provides financial aid to any students from Carbon County, Pennsylvania, who are students at any Harvard school. So Mr. Lentz's legacy lives on not only through teaching and our lectures, but also through support for students. I would say that's the best kind of gift that one can get here, uh, so we can, uh, in long absentia, uh, uh, take our hats off to Mr. Lentz. Now, our speaker is going to be introduced by my colleague, uh, Professor Stephanie Paulsell, who is the Houghton Professor of the Practice of Ministry Studies. She's an ordained minister in the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. Uh, she joined the HDS faculty in 2001, just shortly before I came over to join the HDS faculty, and served as Associate Dean for Ministry Studies from 2003 to 2007. In 2007-8, she was also Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, something I was extremely grateful for and would like to persuade her to do it longer, but at least I got a year's worth of assistance there. Before coming to Harvard, she directed ministry studies and was senior lecturer in religion and literature at the University of Chicago Divinity School. Uh, I've had the privilege of teaching courses with Stephanie over the last 10 years, uh, which has been a constant joy for me. We teach a course together in religion and literature. Uh, she studies the points of intersection between intellectual work and spiritual practice, between the academic study of religion and the practices of ministry, and between the contemplative and active dimensions of the vocations of minister and teacher. Her best-known book is perhaps Honoring the Body, Meditations on a Christian Practice, and most recently she's published a commentary together with Harvey Cox, our colleague, uh, Lamentations and the Song of Songs, which is in the series Belief, a Theological Commentary on the Bible. So, Stephanie, I'll turn it over happily to you. Thank you very much. It's a very great pleasure for me to introduce the Lenz Lecturer in Religious Ethics, Stephen Jungkite. Stephen holds the MDiv, MA, MPhil, and PhD from Yale University and yet he still consented to come here with all those Yale, Yale degrees. 
Um, his research focuses on the development and trajectory of modern liberal expressions of Christian thought and the ways geography and space influence that development in the 19th and 20th centuries. Additionally, he is interested in the ethical issues surrounding urbanization, architecture, travel, and globalization, including what those realities mean for human bodies and human lives. His book, Spaces of Modern Theology, will be published soon with Palgrave Macmillan Press. Just before coming to Harvard, Stephen worked as a hospital chaplain in Bridgeport, Connecticut, where he witnessed firsthand the, the effects of a decaying urban zone on human bodies. And these kinds of experiences, I think, have shaped his research questions and his work in his classrooms and in his research. He's also served churches in Philadelphia, New Haven, and Newport, Vermont, and is ordained in the Presbyterian Church USA. He's married to Rachel, a pianist and teacher, and they have three children, Sabina, five, Elsa, two, and August, six months. I know something about Stephen's teaching here because we taught in the same classroom last semester. I taught right after him. Um, and waiting outside the door for Stephen's classes to end, I caught a glimpse of some very lively discussions that always continued as Stephen and his students spilled out into the hallway. We're fortunate tonight to be invited into that ongoing conversation. Please join me in welcoming Steve Youngkite. Well, it's a great honor to stand before you this evening as the Lentz Lecturer. As Stephanie mentioned, when I was first presented with this opportunity last spring, I was working what seemed to be an endless cycle of shifts as a hospital chaplain, witnessing the ordinary traumas of urban life in the 21st century. It was an immensely instructive time, but I missed writing and reading and teaching and conversing in an environment such as this. And so that has made my time here deeply pleasurable. And so to Dean Graham, to Stephanie Pulsell, to the staff of this institution, but most of all to the incredible students gathered in and around HDS, I'm very grateful. It's been nothing short of a joy to be a teacher and a reader and a writer among you over the course of this past year. And it's an honor to be at this podium this evening. The terms of the Lentz Lectureship stipulate that an exemplary priest, minister, or layperson speak upon a theme related to the words Christo et Ecclesia, Christ and Church, which appear in the Harvard Seal. Such terms provide enormous leeway, and so my theme concerns a topic near and dear to my heart over the past several years, the production of space in modern Christian thought. As stories of borders and mass migrations, empire and territorial disputes have flooded the news cycle in recent years, so too space has emerged as a dominant concept in theoretical literature. Scholars of religion like Marcea Eliada and Jay-Z Smith have long explored the importance of space in their work, and a good many more theorists operating in ritual studies have added to our growing understanding of space and religion but very little work has been done on the ways Christian thought itself functions as a category in the production of geography and power. The Christian tradition is, after all, saturated with an imagination of space, from stories of creation to stories of exodus and wandering, from travels throughout the Mediterranean world to a final poetic vision of a utopian city. That space has gone largely unnoticed in Christian thought suggests not the absence of space itself from theology, but an inability to perceive it, and thereafter to decode it. Space entails urban planning, architecture, and the built environment. But for my purposes here, I'll be referring to space as an imaginative category, an epistemic frame out of which determinate spaces like cities, architectures, and borders emerge. In our post-colonial and global era of territorial struggles, when much of the planet has been uprooted by armed conflicts, environmental degradation, and intractable poverty, theologians and other students of religious thought urgently 
need to learn how to perceive the consequences of space and place, not only in our built environments, but in our inherited traditions and texts, which have the power to convey and shape a spatial imagination. But what traditions and what texts within the wider array of Christian thought will be most helpful in creating a pedagogy of space? There are several notable spatial metaphors in 20th century theology, among them Paul Tillich's Ground of Being, Karl Rahner's Horizon of Transcendence, and Karl Barth's Craters, Voids, Percussion Points, and Dried Up Riverbeds found in his epistle. The latter metaphors have been the most noisy and dominant throughout the 20th century. They were once useful, perhaps, in confronting a church complicitous with state power in the First World War and in resisting Hitler, but they are no longer helpful in our cultural moment. We can no longer afford to understand theological production as unfolding in a void, a negative space, from whence the despairing theologian heroically lobs missives into the wider culture as if from afar. Theological writing is always already a cultural production unfolding within a fixed set of cultural coordinates, which are then related to other coordinates and other cultural locations. If craters and voids no longer adequately describe our context of hyper-urbanization and connectivity, I would suggest following Mark C. Taylor, Manuel Castells, Michael Hart, and Antonio Negri, that the network might be a more convincing way of construing the needs of our theological moment. Castells defines the network as a set of interconnected nodes, which creates an open structure or system able to expand without limits, integrating new nodes so long as they are able to communicate within the network. Taylor provides a helpful clarification by adding that a node, as the word implies, is a knot in a web of relations. Knots function like switches and routers that send, receive, and transmit information throughout the network. The web of nodes forms a distributed network, which is radically decentered. The theological sources that can best fund this network imagination are precisely those that many in the 20th century went to great lengths to repress, the modern liberal tradition of the 19th century. In particular, I have been convinced for some time that Friedrich Schleiermacher's experiments in modern theology are richly suggestive resources for an imagination of a spatial network in theology. Schleiermacher lived and wrote in a period of sweeping cultural and spatial upheavals, a period analogous to our own in terms of dizzying change. Those upheavals include the French Revolution, the breakup of the Holy Roman Empire, the dissolution and consolidation of various German-speaking territories, the military quest by Napoleon to conquer the known world, the onset of industrial capitalism, the ongoing work, work of mapping the contours of the planet through voyages of exploration, the colonization of far-flung lands by European powers, and the concomitant rise of nationalism as an ideology. Those events combined with a series of astonishing technological innovations during Schleiermacher's lifetime, including the development of the first railroads, the invention of the steamboat, and even the first instance of air travel in hot air balloons. Schleiermacher's theological production is shaped by all of those tectonic shifts, which indicate a profound alteration of the very experience of time and space. It is from within such a world that Schleiermacher can articulate something akin to a network of parts linking up to a greater whole, each one dependent upon the other. Here is how Schleiermacher puts it in the speeches, his treatise from 1799, quote, to accept everything individual as a part of the whole and everything limited as a representation of the infinite is religion, he says. In order to facilitate an understanding of what that might mean, 
Schleiermacher counsels his readers to imagine themselves at the farthest point of the material world, such that our visual perspective within the material world is radically altered. You will not see the same objects in another order, but you will discover new objects in wholly new regions, he writes. Shortly after that statement, we find the metaphor of the universe as a magnetic atmosphere, which through diffusion places what is most distant in active contact. By the time he publishes the Christian faith in 1821, we find him making the following statement. That feeling of absolute dependence is most complete when we identify ourselves and our self-consciousness with the whole world and feel ourselves in the same way as not less dependent. This identification can only succeed insofar as in thought we unite everything that in appearance is scattered and isolated. And by means of this unifying association, conceive of everything as one. It's a beautiful vision, one that might be usefully reappropriated in our current global moment, but it comes with a hitch, and that's what I'd like to explore with you this evening. One important consequence of all the cultural, technological, and spatial developments of the early 19th century had to do with the way competing life systems or other religious expressions were understood. As increased contact with other parts of the world became the norm, flat-footed pronouncements about the superiority of Christianity became difficult to maintain. In her book, The Invention of World Religions, Tomoko Masuzawa traces how throughout the 19th century, the rhetorical strategy of Christian triumphalism gave way to a regime of pluralism in which various discursive entities with their own rituals and practices suddenly emerged as objects of study, Buddhism, Hinduism, Confucianism, Shinto, and many others. These could all be clearly demarcated and thereafter read against other competing rituals and practices in other parts of the world. Importantly, however, it was European scholars operating with a latent Christian theology who created the cultural gridwork into which all of the so-called religions could be placed. In the same way that Enlightenment thinkers could revel in the cultural diversity of the world, provided each of those cultures maintained their place within an absolute world space, so too pluralism relished religious diversity so long as the religions were firmly fixed in place. Under the regime of pluralism that Masuzawa elaborates, Christianity still tacitly governed the cultural grid into which those traditions were fixed. So too, it regulated the geographies in which those traditions were relegated. Schleiermacher lived and wrote at the threshold of this transition to pluralism, and the network he elaborates is implicated in that shift. In the long introduction to the Christian faith, Schleiermacher orders the religions of the world into an ascending hierarchy, with Christianity placed at the pinnacle, where it can survey and organize those other religious expressions according to its own theological rules. It is a discussion that emerges a mere 30 pages into a text that stretches some 700 pages long, wedged between a discussion of the church and a discussion of Jesus of Nazareth. The placement of that discussion suggests a degree of anxiety about those alternative religious expressions, even as it suggests the ways the other religions were already contained in and had already given shape to. Schleiermacher's theological imagination of the world. In the time that remains, I'd like to organize my comments first around an exploration of Schleiermacher's taxonomy of religions, for it is derived from a reading of space where religious expressions are judged on their ability to imagine and command large swaths of territory. While it is not immediately evident in the introduction how the theological mechanics of Schleiermacher's taxonomy operate, that machinery is revealed in the doctrine of God, which I'll explore in the second part of this lecture. There we find that it is the infinite, spaceless qualities of Schleiermacher's God that justifies and organizes his taxonomy of religions, giving Christianity preeminence over Judaism, Islam, and polytheism, Schleiermacher's catch-all term for the Eastern religions. <clears throat> 
In essence, the network that Schleiermacher elaborates confirms Masazawa's argument where an interconnected world system is generated with Christianity holding the levers of power. And it's an arrangement of power that gets passed along across the decades in liberal theology, appearing in some late essays by Trelch in the World Religions, and in Paul Tillich's 1963 volume, Christianity and Encounters with the World Religions. The spatial gestures that Schleiermacher makes early in the 19th century, then, are anything but isolated. At the conclusion of this talk, however, I'll show that for all the troublesome implications of Schleiermacher's organization of the other religions, his nuanced language and careful rhetoric can be bent, refracted, allowing a different spatial logic to emerge, one that moves away from monotheistic visions of spatial control and toward a complex vision of planetary interdependence. By holding Schleiermacher's feet to the fire that he himself lit, I wish to use his vision of absolute dependence to yield a vision of polytheism, an ethical imperative in our interconnected and global religious moment. The Other Religions. Schleiermacher's discussion of the other religions extends for three paragraphs in the Christian faith. In the first, Schleiermacher elaborates a system of classification whereby different species of religion are theorized and then different grades of self-consciousness are outlined within each. In the third, Schleiermacher discusses the differences between aesthetic and teleological forms of religion. But it is his second set of considerations in paragraph eight that I wish to focus on here. Paragraph eight offers a typology of religion where the three monotheistic faiths are contrasted with those religions that organize the world otherwise. Space plays a crucial role throughout Schleiermacher's categorization of the religions, but nowhere more so than here. It is, in effect, an ascending hierarchy of spatial awareness and control that defines each religious expression. The ladder of ascent begins with so-called primitive forms of religion, or what Schleiermacher will variously call idol worship, fetishism, or polytheism. According to Schleiermacher, the feature of these primitive religious expressions that makes them subordinate to monotheism is that they ascribe to a deity, quote, an influence only over a limited field of objects or processes, beyond which its own interest and sympathy do not extend. What keeps humans on this most basic level is an inability to imagine any kind of spatiality beyond their local concerns. It is when numerous household gods are combined into one being, which is then joined to a multiplicity of other such beings, that polytheism proper begins to take shape. But insofar as those beings continue to cling to regional habitations, polytheism remains in the sphere of idol worship and fetishism. Schleiermacher writes, polytheism proper is present only when the local references quite disappear and the gods form an organized and coherent plurality. As one of these beings becomes related to the whole system of deities, and that system to the whole of existence, one begins to detect the emergence of monotheism. The more any single one of these beings is related to the whole system of them, Schleiermacher says, and this system in turn to the whole of existence as it appears in consciousness, the more definitely is the dependence of everything finite expressed in the religious self-consciousness. Insofar as the world and its gods begin to emerge as a manifold of interlinking parts joined into a greater emergent whole, the more will it exhibit traits of monotheism as an organizing principle of that world system. Such an account presupposes an understanding of the world as an absolute and homogeneous space. Insofar as the world is conceived as a philosophical totality, a particular geography must of necessity fall out of that totality. Monotheism then carries within it an implicit cartography of the globe, one that is absent from polytheistic forms of religion. If idol worship and polytheism represent a far too limited sense of spatiality 
where the power of the god extends only over a locale or region, monotheism enables one to perceive and internalize not so much a limited set of deities in their attendant spaces, but the world itself. Now understood as a spatial totality, in a telling passage worth quoting in full, one that makes the spatial and geographical dimensions of Schleiermacher's argument plain, he writes, in so far as we are constituent parts of the world, and therefore in so far as we take up the world into our self-consciousness and expand the latter into a general consciousness of finitude, we are conscious of ourselves as absolutely dependent. For if we are conscious of ourselves as such, and in our finitude as absolutely dependent, the same holds true of all finite existence. And in this connection, we take up the whole world, along with ourselves, into the unity of our self-consciousness. Thus, the different ways of representing that existence outside of us to which the consciousness of absolute dependence refers depend partly on the degree of extensiveness of the self-consciousness, for as long as a man identifies himself only with a small part of finite existence, his God will remain a fetish. Monotheism thus unifies the various processes of the world into a coherent and overarching totality, one that combines both internal psychic states and an external geospatial imagination, or what Schleiermacher here calls the extensiveness of self-consciousness. This account of the supremacy of monotheism must be understood as intimately linked with an awareness of global space, where world and finite existence encompass the enormity of the planet itself. It is an awareness that coincides with the emerging communication systems of the 19th century, witnessed in widely dispersed travel networks and technological revolutions. Here, monotheism presides over the unification of the world's spaces into a unified system. It is, admittedly, an attractive vision in which all find themselves dependent upon all as finite and limited creatures within the total system of nature. And yet it remains an ambiguous vision in that monotheism supplies the frame in which this interdependence can be imagined. Thus, even as a gorgeous and hopeful vision of global interdependence is put forth, that sense of interdependence can only be accomplished by the triumph of monotheism over other religious expressions. That eventuality is stated openly enough, for Schleiermacher immediately suggests that as soon as any portion of humanity develops the belief in one God overall, man will not in any region of the earth remain stationary on one of the lower planes, he says. He continues, for this belief is always engaged, if not always in the best way, in the endeavor to propagate itself and disclose itself to the receptive faculties of mankind. And this succeeds eventually, as we can see, even among the rudest human races. On the other hand, there is nowhere any trace, so far as history reaches, of a relapse from monotheism in the strict sense. The transition to monotheism is, for Schleiermacher, within the realm of the inevitable, unfolding as steadily as biological evolution or history itself. Thus, monotheism functions as a tool within the ongoing repertory of techniques and strategies that are used to justify the expansion of European culture abroad. If there are better and worse ways of undertaking that expansion, as Schleiermacher hints, that should not obscure its inexorability. Thus far, we have seen that space is a, is a determining factor in the dominance of monotheism over other forms of religious expression. But space plays an equally important role in differentiating the three forms of monotheism from one another, such that Christianity stands superior to Judaism and to Islam. The latter portion of paragraph eight takes up an evaluation of the relative merits of the three monotheisms, beginning with Judaism. Schleiermacher argues that Judaism betrays a lingering trace of fetishism, evidenced by their frequent reversion to idol worship in the pages of the Hebrew Bible. By drawing this comparison with fetishism and idol worship, Schleiermacher suggests that Judaism represents a far too constrained imagination of the world, limited by region and blood ties. That's a, that's a theme that continually emerges throughout Schleiermacher's writings. In the speeches, for example, he informs his readers that the vantage point of Judaism is far too limited 
a fact that helps to explain its short duration as a viable religious system. By contrast, it is Christianity that is, quote, more glorious, more sublime, more deeply penetrating into the spirit of systematic religion and extending farther over the whole universe. So too, in the speeches, Schleiermacher contends that the spatial imagination of Judaism remained too concentrated in scope, limiting the love of Yahweh to a single race, Abraham's children, as they developed in a specific region of the world. Later in the Christian faith, Schleiermacher will castigate the Jewish prophets for working merely for national ends, whereas Christ himself, on Schleiermacher's account, included but also transcended national or regional obligations. Those spatial deficiencies result in an insufficient form of monotheism. If Judaism represents the lingering influence of idol worship within monotheism, Islam then exhibits the after effects of polytheism within its rituals. For Schleiermacher, Islam betrays this relation by the strongly sensuous content of its ideas and in the large measure of that influence of the sensible upon the character of religious emotions, which elsewhere keeps men on the level of polytheism. It's the sensuous element that sets Schleiermacher off, for that very sensuality indicated too deep an attachment to material and sensible forms of existence, thus preventing the monotheistic imagination from achieving final liftoff into the ether of the universal, in which all can be united to all. Another way to say it is that for Schleiermacher, Islam is too bound to a specific notion of place. Like Judaism, Islam thus reveals itself to Schleiermacher as having a vantage point that is still too constrained, failing to extend its imagination over the whole universe. Having dispatched the other forms of monotheism, Schleiermacher concludes his discussion of the merits of monotheistic faiths by asserting that Christianity is the purest form of monotheism. It is, he says, the most perfect and the most developed form of religion, the one in which a universal and unified sense of the world comes to fullest expression. If idol worship begins in the relative privacy of the household, Christianity shows itself capable of encompassing and then transcending the material universe itself, including the material spaces of that universe. While it's tempting to write these comments off as somehow unattached to the wider system of doctrines that Schleiermacher elaborates, they're predicated upon a deeper theological problem that can only be discovered by examining the doctrine of God. And so for the next several minutes, I'll be crawling around in the boiler room, examining the engineering features that allow Schleiermacher's spatial religious network to hum. Omnipresence. One of the formal innovations of Schleiermacher's theology is its refusal to isolate the doctrine of God from other doctrines within that system. Indeed, it is dispersed throughout the system, spread across it, in order to suggest that the knowledge of God is never given, given in full. It is within the doctrine of creation that Schleiermacher treats the attributes of eternity, omnipresence, and omnipotence. As with the material and the other religions, all three attributes have spatial implications built into them. But for the sake of time, I'll limit my comments here to omnipresence. For it's there that the full implications of Schleiermacher's conception of space becomes clear. Schleiermacher introduces omnipresence by contrasting the spatial effects of divine and finite causality. He argues that finite causality has greater or less potency at different points in space, least where the space is occupied with so-called dead forces, and greater where there is a greater development of life, and greatest where clear human consciousness is active, and so upwards. It is a hierarchical formula of vertical ascent, moving from inert matter through simple forms of plant life all the way up through animal life. His formula culminates with human consciousness and even leaves room for levels extending beyond human consciousness, including, presumably, God. At each level, the command of space will be greater or less, depending on the relative complexity of the life form. But it is with the phrase, quote, where clear human consciousness is active, that we are forced to pause. For the description's clear 
and active suggest that there are forms of human consciousness that do not exhibit those qualities, or at least exhibit them more or less fully according to various mental or developmental capacities. Such exceptions would thereby reveal a diminished spatial potency, and therefore also a diminished capacity for receiving the divine presence. Schleiermacher does note that no distinction in the almighty presence of God is hereby posited, but only in the receptivity of the finite being to the causal activity of which the divine presence is related. In a series of travel essays written in the early 1800s, Schleiermacher wrote about the Australian Aborigines, characterizing them as existing, quote, at the lowest rung of human development. And so we might wonder where the Aborigines or other non-European cultures might exist in such a schema. As such, it is necessary to underscore the way such a hierarchy of being trades upon and participates in a set of wider cultural assumptions. Even if receptivity to the divine presence is diminished, Schleiermacher is forced to affirm that according to the spaceless properties of God, the divine causality and presence cannot be thought as greater or smaller in different places. That causality is everywhere, in Prussia, Australia, or anywhere else. Space then cannot be understood as a determining factor in the presence of God. The capacity to imagine space can, however, become a determining factor in one's ability or lack thereof to receive and to participate in that divine presence. The clear implication is that finite causality possesses greater points of potency among more developed peoples than primitive ones. And the higher one rises on the ascending scale of civilization, the better equipped to receive the divine presence one will be. That means that the other religions will also exhibit gradations in their capacity to intuit the divine presence based on where they can be charted on that sliding developmental scale. These introductory comments on the divine omnipresence demonstrate how quickly abstract discussions about theology and space have the capacity to bear themselves out in the organization and control of material spaces, particularly among the peoples inhabiting those spaces. Theology writes itself upon the surface of the earth. Turning now to the attribute of omnipresence itself, Schleiermacher is concerned to remove as best he can any element of space from the being of God. To do so, he walks his readers through several spatial formulations, all of which he eventually rejects before settling on his preferred statement of omnipresence. God is in himself. It is a formula that is best understood apophatically, for while the God-world relation is not immediately evident in Schleiermacher's chosen phrase, it has the effect of removing any spatial contrast from the being of God. If the phrase seems to imply a self-enclosed and contained image of God, Schleiermacher is quick to point out that the effects of God's causal being in God's self are everywhere. Thus, the divine causality can be felt and experienced everywhere throughout the created order without reducing the being of God to that order. Furthermore, such a phrase prevents one from imagining a finite cosmos bounded by an empty space outside of it and around it, where one form of omnipresence would obtain within that bounded cosmos, while another would obtain outside. Taken to its, to its extreme, such an idea presupposes a radical difference between the essence of God and God as revealed in creation, a bifurcation that Schleiermacher wants and needs to avoid. Stating that God is in God's self, then, functions as a kind of apophatic tool by which the being of God is pr protected from all such divisions of inside and outside, effectively canceling any speculation as to the location, home, or place of God. In other words, God as in himself prevents the human imagination from projecting any categories of space onto God whatsoever, thus helping to secure the spaceless properties of this God. The postscript to the attribute of omnipresence provide, provides us with a further clarification of the meaning of this phrase, as well as another attempt to characterize the spacelessness inherent to God. 
The chosen heading for the postscript is the immensity of God, a formula that parallels the eternity of God with regard to time. Immensity and eternity are not simply a removal of the limits of time and space, but instead function as the very condition for the imagination of time and space at all. Just as a transcendent ego exists outside of the concrete manifestations of an individual consciousness, holding the variations in the manifold together as the experience of one conscious subject, so the eternity and immensity of God are conceived as that which stands outside of time and space while binding an experiential sense of time and space into something coherent. To say that God is in himself as infinite, immense, and immeasurable suggests that it is God who supplies and coordinates the very possibility of space itself. As immense and immeasurable, Schleiermacher's God encompasses and surpasses all that is measurable within time and space, including any other gods who would appear in the various cultures of the world. All of this has enormous implications for the ways Christianity is related to the other religions. By arguing for the spaceless properties of God, Schleiermacher makes Christianity the measure against which all the other religions can be classified and grouped. On this accounting, the Christian imagination should be capable of intuiting the vast scope of the material world and of organizing that world, not so much because God encompasses those spaces, but precisely because this God stands as the condition for the very possibility of imagining space at all. In other words, not only do the other religions have a deficient imagination of space, but the very categories that such religious expressions depend upon for the extension of their power are themselves dependent upon the spaceless properties of Christianity's God. Thus, even as Schleiermacher insists, as an emerging pluralist, that Christianity has no wish to rule over the other religions, and that it loves the complex interactions of the whole, it turns out that it is the very idea of God which structures and organizes the complex interactions of that whole. While such a stance might seem initially generous, the superiority of Christianity over all the other religious expressions is implicit behind it. The doctrine of God's omnipresence thus becomes an inadvertent technology for the imagination and control of global space, a way to conceive of the planet as belonging to a unified spatial field that can be subdivided and parceled out. If Christianity does indeed love the diversity of the greater whole, as Schleiermacher claims, one suspects that is only because God tacitly governs the operations of that whole, much as a potentate might govern over the provinces, precisely by allowing those provincial authorities to retain their limited spheres of control. It's now time to leave the boiler room and its engineering, moving towards something like a conclusion. Given my diagnosis of Schleiermacher's monotheism, it remains to be asked why we should continue reading him. Why uphold this source of liberal theology as opposed to others? And why uphold liberal theology at all? The answer for me comes in Schleiermacher's emphasis upon absolute dependence, a vision that arises from his deeply interconnected sense of the world. Recall his statement on finitude in the discussion of the other religions once more. In so far as we are constituent parts of the world, and therefore in so far as we take up the world into our self-consciousness and expand the latter into a general consciousness of finitude, we are conscious of ourselves as absolutely dependent. That, I think, is a marvelous way of emphasizing the complex interdependencies among human beings, and indeed among all of life, in a shrinking and accelerating world. But for all the interconnection that Schleiermacher emphasizes, and for all the ways finitude enters his discourse, a curious feature of his theology is that he rarely takes up the question of suffering, of pain, of maimed bodies and lives. He rarely takes up the question of life itself as something vulnerable, and thus as something truly dependent. The reasons are tied to his imagination of monotheism, 
and the divine causality. Finite individuals exist in finite spaces that exist within finite cultures, all of which are then secured, organized, and stabilized by the power of God. Finitude, then, becomes something of a half-measure, a failure to follow the logic of interdependence all the way down, where bodies and lives are dependent upon one another for their very being, for their very bread, for the very spaces in which they exist and dwell. And so we need to set Schleiermacher free to realize his own best instincts by transposing the language of finitude into one of fragility and precariousness, one that recognizes the complex ways our own vulnerabilities are joined to those of others and to the natural world itself. In the global network in which we live, we need a radicalized vision of absolute dependence, a vision that recognizes that all are fragile, vulnerable, and, precariousness, and precarious in relation to all. If Schleiermacher's world whole was secured by a monotheistic vision of power, then the deeper and fuller sense of absolute dependence that we require is realized by a renunciation of that power, a renunciation of the pretense that anyone could ever possess it in the first place. Given the mixed legacy of monotheism in Schleiermacher and in the liberal tradition that followed him, and given the competing versions of monotheism are behind some of the more troublesome features of our contemporary world, perhaps it is time to set that term aside as a relic of an earlier religious era. That would create an opening in which polytheism could emerge as a contemporary possibility. Indeed, that is the form of religious life most consonant with a vision of absolute dependence in the precarious global network we all of us inhabit. One way to imagine that reality is to treat the book called The Christian Faith itself as a kind of space, for its arrangement subtly hints at the polytheism I have in mind. The spatial taxonomy of the other religions is placed in a long introduction, one that stands outside the system of doctrines proper, and yet remains within the bounds of the book itself. That discussion is then neither inside nor outside the system of Christianity but stands as liminal to it, a sign both of what cannot quite be incorporated into Christian thought as Schleiermacher conceived it, even as it suggests the ways those other religious expressions haunted Christianity internally. That placement signals a gap or opening in the doctrinal network that Schleiermacher elaborates, one that renders the Christian God, or at least Schleiermacher's God, as well as the person imagining that God, a less than stable identity. The literary theorist J. Hillis Miller writes about the paralogic inherent to such an open structure, which follows the logic of the parasite. Miller says, a thing in para is not only simultaneously on both sides of the boundary line between inside and out. It is also the boundary itself, the screen, which is a permeable membrane connecting inside and outside. It confuses them with one another, allowing the outside in, making the inside out, dividing them and joining them. Read in this way, what Schleiermacher's discussion of the other religions signals is the beginning of a networked identity, where the Christian faith, together with the doctrine of God, becomes what it is only through this paralogic of relationality. So the Christian faith may function as a network, but this strange logic, make, logic makes it apparent that the Christian faith only takes on its identity as a network by becoming plugged in and wired to other networks, a network within a network. Questions remain, however. Is this network simply a veiled return to the polytheism that Schleiermacher sought to transcend? Is it no more than a reversal of his teleology? such that the ineluctable march toward universal monotheism wraps back around to an earlier form of polytheism? I think not. Read generously, Schleiermacher's monotheism was a way of undoing a narrow kind of tribalism 
where various regions or cultures each claim their own competing vision of the absolute, heedless of the claims of others. That is a polytheism that I too scrupulously wish to avoid. Rather, the polytheism I have in mind operates in a way analogous to Jean-Luc Nancy's being singular plural, to Judith Halberstam's queer subcultural lives, and to Hart and Negri's dispersed and decentered multitude. Though operating in different theoretical registers, those thinkers put forth the notion of individuals, groups, and social collectivities operating according to their own internal logics, though never in isolation from one another. Read in terms of religion, we can say that each of the religions is wired into the others and becomes what it is only in relation to the other singular pluralities outside of it. The very existence of Christianity, then, could only be derived from its relation to those singularities that are simultaneously outside of it and inside of it. Moreover, each singularity is composed of a set of pluralities within itself, a differential network of relations, not unlike the very text of Schleiermacher's The Christian Faith. And then finally, in the version of polytheism that I envision, each singular religion is joined in the work of the commons, interlinked with one another in a common project that seeks the flourishing of those most vulnerable from the effects of global capitalism. Here's how Hart and Negri put it. Each local struggle functions as a node that communicates with all other nodes without any hub or center of intelligence, they write. Each struggle remains singular and tied to its local conditions but at the same time is immersed in the common web. This form of organization is the most fully realized political example we have of the concept of the multitude. Transposed into a religious idiom, polytheism functions as a way of mapping the multitudes, mapping all those for whom religion provides a way of maintaining a sense of meaning, dignity, affirmation, support, and resistance within the relentless time and space accelerations of globalization. The polytheism I have in mind is the religious network humming to life. All of the aforementioned insights provide a welcome opening for the imagination of space. If Schleiermacher's logic has emphasized the ways in which God is exempted from space by furnishing the very category of space, Seizing upon Schleiermacher's own emphasis on interconnectivity and relationality allows us to understand that, far from being abstracted from space, Schleiermacher's God is a product of that category. Instead of holding the levers of power through the imagination and control of space, an emphasis upon networks and a renewed sense of absolute dependence suggests that in the Christian imagination, God only is and can only ever exist in relation to the other religions, indeed in relation to the other gods. That would mean that instead of applying a spatialized pluralism to the religions of the world, in which Christianity tacitly supplies the conditions and parameters in which the various religions can be fixed, Christianity too takes its place both within the interreligious network and as itself an internal interreligious inter network. Neither Christianity nor any of the other religions could be understood as bounded cultural systems then, where one fulfills another or dialogues with another. On this accounting, it would be impossible to accept another religion, because in an important way, that other religion is always already internal to Christianity itself and vice versa. In such a configuration, the God of Christian theology becomes a parasite of the other religions, of the other gods, even as God becomes their host as well. The absolute space that Schleiermacher elaborates thus becomes something fluid with porous boundaries, zones, and territories that cannot be fixed within a spatial hierarchy. By theorizing the globe as a vast and sweeping panoramic totality, Schleiermacher provides a frame to imagine the fragile lives that comprise that complex web of relations. Released to realize his own gifts, he enables his readers to imagine the fragile and complex religions 
that comprise that web, where Christianity may take up its place as one among many, a particular set of religious practices joined to other religious practices. By emphasizing the sense of fragility that arises from this intuition of the whole, this reading of Schleiermacher provides the means for imagining the concrete bodily struggles arising in various corners of the globe, from the border regions of Mexico to the makeshift slum cities of Dhaka, from the factories of Shenzhen to the abandoned ruins of Detroit. If Schleiermacher's absolute dependence was neither absolute nor dependent enough, Relinquishing the comforts of both monotheism and its spatial organization creates an opening not merely for finitude, but for fragility, for maimed, broken, and struggling bodies. With such an understanding, it becomes simultaneously possible to embrace the ways the various religions are dependent upon one another for their very being, even as it becomes possible to imagine a more radical form of absolute dependence in which all are dependent upon all, and no one is extraneous. That vision, in turn, allows us to begin imagining different arrangements of space and different arrangements of life than those on offer in our current economic and political climate. Freed to realize his own best insights, Schleiermacher becomes an indispensable source for mapping a new theological terrain, for mapping a new future for liberal theology. Thank you.